small rack. We don't have to be so quiet here because it's a very small crowd. <laughs> so we should smile a little bit more. And uh, dear friend, thank you so much for coming here tonight. We're about to introduce our first seminar in our annual seminar series. Why I'm saying series is because we're going to do this once a month. This specific seminar is the implication of Bill 148 on small businesses. And I think everybody here is um, really running a small business and somehow rather involved with the small businesses. Our guest speaker tonight is uh, Aaron Rousseau. And Aaron is a founding partner of Rousseau Mazuka. He practiced employment law for over 10 years Aaron has been quoted in the Globe and Mail and Toronto Star and has appeared on CBC and CTV to discuss workplace laws. Aaron has also published numerous articles in the Dismissal and Employment Law Digest and Canadian Occupational Safety Magazine. He has also appeared before entry level of courts in Ontario as well as Ontario Labor Relations Board and Human Rights Tribunal. In addition, I would like to personally recommend Aaron to everyone here. I, our firm has been using Aaron services for the last several years, and we can attest of his effectiveness. Our goal for this seminar, or seminar series, once, is to do it once a month, to help small businesses to adjust to fast-changing economic and legislative environment. Our next seminar will be conducted on March 1st, at the same time, between 6 and 8 p.m., and we will have a speaker from a provincial government, York Works. The speaker from the government will introduce various government programs available for uh, small businesses for uh, job hiring and training incentives. Also, our goal for this uh, event is to provide networking environment to the people attending the seminar. We encourage you, if you decide to come back, to bring promotional and advertising material from your businesses, and uh, we will make them available to all the attendees who are coming here throughout the year, and provide you with possibility to acquire new customers in the future. That's that's all. That's my short speech. Aaron, you're welcome to. Thanks, Eugene. Uh, gotta stay out of the way of that uh, that projector. Uh, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, I am gonna hopefully say some things that will be helpful. Uh, a lot of people have been expressing a lot of concern about some of the changes that have happened uh, to the Employment Standards Act and some other pieces of legislation. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. And we can jump to the first slide, uh, Eugene. Uh, so what I, as I'm going to, as it says there, I'm not going to try and cover everything. We're going to just be going for about half an hour, and then I'm going to take uh, some questions uh, after that. Uh, there's a lot of changes, but we're going to talk. I'm going to talk about some of the ones that uh, are most impactful on uh, on small business people. Uh, and I'm not just here to talk about problems, I'm also going to talk about solutions and give, uh, point the way towards some ways to solve or at least reduce the impact of some of these changes. Uh, so, yeah, there you, you, knew, you knew it, there you were Eugene, you're on, you're on the ball. Um, so the four big areas I'm going to be talking about, uh, one of them is the change uh, in the definition of whether someone's a contractor or whether they are an employee. I'm gonna be talking about some of the provisions about equal pay for people doing the same job. I'm gonna be talking about uh, something that may catch people. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a huge change, but I suspect it's gonna trip a lot of people up around personal emergency leave. And then I'm gonna talk a bit about uh, some of the new scheduling provisions. Uh, so with that uh, said, and we can jump ahead, uh, as Eugene said, I've been practicing employment law for uh, go on the next slide um, for uh, for ten years uh, or more, uh, and I'm also a small business person. I've got a firm, uh, have a partner, have employees, have uh, have you know 
some of the same challenges uh, that all small businesses have. So I understand this uh, not just as a lawyer, but also as a business person. Uh, oh, sorry, we were at the disclaimer. That's okay. The disclaimer is really important. Uh, don't sue me. Um, so the, I, 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 what I'm saying uh, is, is, is correct, uh, but it's important to seek specific advice uh, in any particular situation. Uh, just a standard disclaimer. Okay. Um, so uh, did we drop the slide about me? That's okay. I know who I am. I'll talk about myself. There we go. There we go. Um, uh, so I do actually work on both sides. So I spend a lot of my time working for employers, you know, businesses, small and medium size. Uh, so far, Royal Bank's not yet a client, but you know, uh, the hope springs. Um, but I do also work for individuals. Uh, so. That gives me a good perspective to see what's in people's minds uh, when they're looking at this as an employee or looking at it as somebody who's advising employees. Uh, and I have done everything that can be done with the Employment Standards Act, including going to the Labor Relations Board. Okay, so moving uh, on to our first. Uh, yeah, yeah, we did that already. Uh, okay, so the first big topic: contractor versus employee. The big change that's happened in the legislation uh, is one of the big, in this area, is to the definition of employee versus contractor. So what this legislation has done is it's now said everybody is an employee until the employer proves the opposite. So if being an employee means that you're guilty, you're now guilty until proven innocent. So it's not up to the, the worker making a complaint to prove that they are an employee and hence entitled to the protections of the Employment Standards Act. Instead, it's your job as an employer. If there's ever a complaint, you're presumed to be an employer. You're presumed to owe this person every protection under the Employment Standards Act. If you want to say, I don't need to provide something like overtime, because this person's not an employee, they're a contractor, you need to prove that. And if you don't have, if there's no, you don't have anything to support that, then you automatically lose. The employee automatically wins. So that's the big change. They haven't changed the underlying definition of what makes someone a contractor versus what makes them an employee. What they've changed is they've, they've changed the burden of proof. They've made it your job to prove that instead of the employee's job to prove that. So what is the test for whether someone's an employee or whether they're a contractor? There's actually three different tests uh, and they've, there's no consistent usage. All of them are important. Uh, but I'm gonna explain what those tests are and you may see some ways in which some of your people uh, are contractors and under each test or are not. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about ways uh, to try to address some of that. So the first test, this was the one that uh, is the oldest one, is what's called the control test. And the control test says, we wanna look at who controls how, when, and where the work is performed. So if we look at some of these things, it's you know, who controls the hours in which the work is performed? Who controls the breaks? Who controls, if we look at where, who controls where it's performed? Can the person do it from home? Are they doing it off site? Or are they, are they required to be uh, in, the, in a specific office doing it? And not because the task demands that, but because you say so. Uh, you know, who controls, you know, the how? Are, are people trained by the employer very specifically on how to do things, uh, you know, or is it something that they're just supposed to know? Uh, is there a manual that dictates how they do things? Uh, these, are, these are the things that are important to the control test. The control test is also a part of the other, the second test that's used, which is actually the most common test that's used, which is the entrepreneur test. And the entrepreneur test says, in addition to control, we want to look at three other factors. One is who owns the tools uh, that are needed to do the job. 
Uh, the third one is, uh, what is the chance of profit uh, and what is the risk of loss? The tools, although it's part of the test, usually isn't that important. Uh, though if tools are expensive, uh, and particularly if it's a question like a truck driver, uh, you know, owning the truck is a huge issue. Um, but if it's something like owning a computer, uh, it's less important. Uh, but the issue of chance of profit, risk of loss, is often what trips up uh, businesses uh, that are looking to have people be classified as contractors. Because if you're paying somebody by the hour, they really have absolutely no chance of profit and they have absolutely no risk of loss. Uh, if they can bring somebody else in to do the work for them, actually, that starts to be a different issue. Because uh, then in theory, they could pay that person less than you're paying at the hourly rate and they could make a profit. Or if there's other ways to make a profit, if it's, uh, that's, another, that's another thing to look at. We need to look at loss. So that's the entrepreneur test. And then the organization test um, says, uh, you know, leave aside control, leave aside profit. How integrated is the person into the organization? Uh, so does this person show up on an organizational chart? Does this person uh, you know, attend staff meetings? Uh, does this person have a role that's integrated into the processes of the business? Or is it just something that's sort of bolted on at the end? Uh, so these are, these are the tests that we use to determine whether someone's an employee or a contractor. And I have quite literally argued these in front of Ministry of Labor uh, people uh, to determine whether someone's entitled to something they're claiming. Uh, so those tests are the same, but now you are guilty until proven innocent. So what can we do about this? What are, or before, before I get to what to do about this, why does this matter? Why, are, why is this so important? Let's jump to the next slide. So this matters for a host of reasons. Some of, most of these reasons that I've listed on here are actually not things found within the Employment Standards Act. But there's a big worry that if you lose under the Employment Standards Act, you may lose under all of these other areas, uh, like the Income Tax Act and so forth. So if somebody is an employee, as the employer, you're responsible, as you doubtless know, uh, for remitting to the government every month, the next month, uh, the taxes that should be withheld on that person's pay. If they're a contractor, not the case. That's their problem. Uh, but if you've been misclassifying them as a contractor and they're actually an employee, the CRA has the power to say, all of the money you should have withheld in taxes, employer, you now have to pay to the CRA, and it's up to you to chase down that individual to try to get back the money you already paid them uh, that was 100% of their salary that should have only been 50% you know, of their salary, or whatever, however the numbers work out. And they can say this about everybody who's covered. So if there's one person where this comes up, there could be a decision that actually affects you know, a dozen people who are classified the same way, or 100 people, uh, and it doesn't necessarily just affect that year. It can go back seven years. So, and there can be interest and penalties. It can be financially catastrophic. Uh, if everybody, if every contractor has been absolutely doing their taxes right and ab is up to date on them, it's not a catastrophe. But as people, uh, as you may know, that's often not the case. Often people are not up to date on their taxes. Uh, so that's, uh, or they have not reported things accurately. So you're potentially the one bearing that risk. Not a nice risk to bear. Another issue is vicarious liability, which is to say, if this person does something negligent, Maybe they're driving and they hit somebody while they're in the course of their job. Uh, you know, are you potentially on the hook as the employer because the way vicarious liability works is it says you are responsible for everything that your employee did. So somebody doesn't have to just sue, doesn't sue that employee. They can sue the entity that stands behind them. Uh, so that's 
another issue that can get expensive. Some things you're gonna be insured for, some things you're not. Agency is another issue. That person can sign contracts that bind you if they're your employee. Uh, WSIB, another very important issue. Uh, here, it's, there can be issue, being a contractor isn't necessarily the end of the analysis, uh, but it's another potentially important area that can be very costly. Uh, similarly, when the, or not similar, when the relationship ends, you may be looking at paying this person a significant amount of money uh, as notice of termination. So if you have a contract that says, I'm allowed to end this contract with no notice whatsoever, or maybe with 30 days, uh, and they turn around and say, actually, I'm an employee, and they're right, then you need to pay them termination and potentially severance pay under the Employment Standards Act a week or two per year, but maybe even more because they might have a contract claim saying they're entitled to reasonable notice. You, depending how long they've been there and what their job is, you could theoretically need to pay them for like a year and a half or two years. Very significant amount. Uh, and then there's the problems of the Employment Standards Act itself, which is what in theory the change is about, uh, which is things like overtime, vacation pay, public holiday pay, like you know uh, Labor Day and so forth, uh, and minimum wage. One of the uh, things to remember is that sometimes vacation pay and overtime will trip you up because you're not accounting for these things. So if you've just been paying somebody an hourly rate uh, and they've been a contractor, and then along comes a complaint and then a finding that they're an employee, 4% of all of the wages they've earned is immediately going to be tacked on uh, as vacation pay. Uh, and if they've been, if the hours that they've worked have sometimes been peaked and valid, and so there's some which are concentrated in, in certain one week periods, you need to have been paying them at time and a half that regular rate. So these are reasons why among many others, why people don't want to have contractors classified as employees. So this is why some of this matters. What can we do about it? Solutions. One of the most important things you can do is have a contract. A contract that is smart, that is tailored to the circumstances. What I like to do where, some, where there's going to be some controversy, sure, somebody looks somewhat like, uh, like an employer, but you know we, wanna, we want them to be a con so somewhat like an employee, but we want them to be a contractor, and you know, there's something to work with. I'm not making it up. Uh, I say, let's put certain things in that contract that are going to help. So let's put in some sort of provision. Uh, perhaps, even if they don't own the tools, maybe let's have them rent the tools from you for a certain amount per hour, and let's have them get paid that amount more per hour so that there's a perfect balance. You're not actually paying them any more, but we've got a way that we're now building in responsibility for the tools. Uh, let's look, there's, a, there's a bunch of other things that we can, you know, that are there, which in terms of you know, who can, uh, selecting the hours, whether they can have somebody else come in and do the job for them, even if that's not something anybody's ever going to do, uh, it can be very powerful to have those things on paper. And so think about solve, uh, you know, at the very least putting together a strong case on paper uh, that somebody is going to be a contractor. Other things that we can do, if you're worried about things like, you know, vicarious liability and agency, uh, you know, think about putting an indemnity provision into the contract you have with this individual, so that if somebody does turn around and sue you for something this person did, you can sue them. Because if they're an employee and there's no, contra no contractual indemnity provision, you're on the hook. You can't say, you know, Ford Motor Company can't say, well, Frank, who was working on the line, messed up the brakes on this car, so we're going to sue Frank. It doesn't work that way. Uh, you know, 